Hello and welcome everyone to the first global Web3 Internet Computer Hackathon called Supernova. The focus of this event is extraordinarily exciting and I'm going to run you through some aspects of the Internet Computer environment and its capabilities and what's possible to let you know just how exciting this is. So Web3 is the third phase of the internet. We started out with Web 1, and uh, that sort of kicked off in the early 90s with people uploading content onto web servers, which would be downloaded into early web browsers, visually rendered, and read. Then, as we neared the end of the century, we saw the first social media, and users began uploading content to servers on the internet so that other users could um, download it into their browsers and read it. So Web 2 really can be characterized by the phrase, write. Web 3 is all about ownership and can be characterized by the word own. In Web 3, users gain control of assets and participation rights directly through holding digital tokens and can participate in the management and effectively hold a pot ownership share in the online services um, that, that they participate in um, through something called Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, or DAOs. So in, in this diagram here, um, we've got a blockchain hosting a bunch of smart contracts. And what we feel very strongly at Definity is that in Web3, Blockchain is the platform, and it is the cloud. And we're going to see online services running 100% from the blockchain. So, so looking at this diagram here, you um, can see those kind of canistry shaped things, smart contracts, which are units of blockchain code that are tamper-proof, um, unstoppable, and, and process tokens. And the colored lines show how those smart contracts are being composed, combined together, to create Web3 services. And here, the users are um, directly interacting on their phones or laptops with the smart contracts hosted by the blockchain over HTTP, um, which, of course, is very apt because this, after all, is Web3. Um, the second important aspect of Web3 is that communities um, will own online services via decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. So looking at the diagram now, we can see that the service is the smart contracts making the service uh, a circle with, with, with a yellow line, and the smart contracts making a DAO a circle with a green line. And the users are now interacting with both, and tokens have entered the game. So um, many of you may be asking, uh, it, is this possible um, on blockchain? Is this really possible? And the answer I'm very, very excited to tell you is yes, it is possible today thanks to moon math cryptography. And of course, I'm talking about the internet computer, which creates an environment in cypherspace um, where you can host these smart contracts. The internet computer is created from special node machines that are run uh, by independent parties around the world. They're essentially publicly owned machines. Um, and these are combined um, over the internet by something called Internet Computer Protocol, which is where the ICP token takes its name from. And Internet Computer Protocol creates the internet computer, which is a general purpose blockchain, a kind of world computer blockchain, which hosts canister smart contracts, which essentially, of course, are just hosted blockchain code. The good news is, um, you know, that this thing's available on Earth uh, already, and um, people are already building super exciting Web3 services. And that's what um, we hope that many of you joining this hackathon will have a go at doing. So 
one of the really amazing and important aspects of the internet computer is that it's amazingly efficient, um, but, but at the same time, it maintains all of those key um, properties that we expect of blockchain. So, you know, it maintains security, liveness, autonomy, censorship resistance, decentralization, and programmability. Now, down the bottom of, of this slide, um, I'm, there are some references to material. I'm, I'm, I guess some of the numbers I'm going to show you next. If you download the PDF version of this um, deck from my Twitter feed, you, you can click on those links. So in the following comparisons, um, you know, uh, we acknowledge that, you know, blockchains have different designs, but we wanted to show you quite how different they could be. So the big um, block on the left is the relative cost of storing a gigabyte of data on the Ethereum blockchain. That's Ethereum version one, which is still proof of work. And it costs about $100, $100 million. It varies. I think today it's about 60, but it's been as high as $300 million for a gigabyte. On the right is the relative cost of storing a gigabyte of data on the Solana blockchain for a year when the price of, of, of one sol is, is $150. So the ratio is um, 1 to 190. So Solana, it's a very different kind of blockchain to Ethereum, but Solana has um, a, you know improved efficiency or at least reduced the cost of storing data on the blockchain by 190 times. Now let's zoom into the Solana block and compare it to the internet computer. All right, so the internet computer block is um, being pointed to by that orange arrow. If you can see it, it is there. It's only about three pixels by three pixels. And um, you might need a sort of high resolution screen to see it. Um, while the cost of storing a gigabyte of data on Solana is um, about half a million dollars per gigabyte per year. The cost of storing a gigabyte of data on the internet computer is about $5 a gigabyte a year. So we've got an improvement um, in efficiency or a reduction in cost of about 100,000 times. And this is very, very important um, because it enables us to do things that you just couldn't do before. Um, now, one way of thinking about this is um, what's the cost to store a simple phone photo on the blockchain for a year? So a phone photo is about three meg. It'll cost you approximately 1.6 cents on the internet computer. But on Solana, it'll cost you more than $1,500. All that price can go up and down as the price of Sol goes up and down. So clearly, it would probably be too expensive to, to store a photo collection on Solana. But it's not just media um, files, of course, that we need to store on the blockchain. Um, if you want to create a social media service, say, on the blockchain, you're going to need to be able to combine structured user data to form custom news feeds for different users and things like that. So um, the cost of storage is very, very important indeed. OK, so I, you know, some of you might be wondering, why not just use use the cloud. Today, most apps and services store and process 99% of their data on the corporate cloud. What problems can ICP solve? So, um, you know, you can imagine saying, I can't keep more, more than a few tokens on my blockchain. My friend keeps telling me to build on Amazon Web Services, but I've got a bad feeling about this. This is the kind of architecture that you'd use there. You would um, combine a database and a web server with some custom DAP code. Um, your web server might be Nginx, your database might, might be MySQL, and you might write your DAP code in Java, say. What's wrong with that? Well, let's have a look. So this is the, the overall architecture. This is the 99% on-cloud architecture for DAPs and services. On the left, we've got the user's laptop. It could be a phone, obviously, um, which is where they receive the content that they interact with. Uh, it, in order to um, perform those interactions, they'll have to have installed a, a crypto wallet, something like MetaMask, that's typically downloaded from the Chrome Web Store or Chrome Play, Play Store. And uh, the content that's in the browser or the app will interact 
over HTTP with, with the web server running on the cloud. Um, the content being returned by the web server, of course, will be you know, credited by the DAP code that's pulling content from the database. And occasionally, um, the user will interact with, with the blockchain, for example, to mint an NFT or create a token or something like that. And in those cases where they need to interact, um, you know, they'll use the wallet and that will trigger the, in trigger the interaction. Um, now, you notice in this architecture, I've actually got a bunch of the, the, the blockchain local nodes, if you want to call them that, running on the cloud too. And, and that's because that's mainly what happens today. So for example, in the Ethereum ecosystem, um, there's this service called Infura that runs on Amazon Web Services. And Infura runs a lot of uh, Ethereum local nodes so developers don't have to. And developers just you know, build that component that, that's constructed from the web server, the DAP code in the database, and their DAP code just talks to, to, to the um, local node run, run by Infura. Um, or, or, for example, if you're talking about Solana, you know, you won't typically run your own uh, node again. You'll just interact with, some, with somebody else's. Okay, so let, let's look at some of the things that can go wrong with this um, a very common architecture. Well, first of all, obviously, um, if you're using, say, a Google Chrome Store or a Play Store to um, ho host the, the, the wallet and, and deploy it into your browser or install it on your phone, um, there's the danger that Google can ban the wallet um, and that would stop your users accessing your service. There's also the danger that Google, Google can steal the tokens. Now, Google, of course, would be very, very unlikely to want to steal tokens, but it would be somebody, you know, maybe somebody working at Google um, could, 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 could act maliciously and, and modify the wallet code. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, of course, you know, this has already happened in the past. You know, Google has indeed banned MetaMask, which the Ethereum, uh, you know, ecosystem depends on, for, for a whole week. Um, but, you know, I, I believe that's not nearly as serious a consequence as could happen if they actually modified the code um, in order to steal people's tokens. Okay, so, you know, the 99% of the DAP or the centralized service is really running on the cloud. You know, the data's in the database and the web server serving the content and there's some DAP code there. Um, the problem with that is, um, you know, the cloud can ban the DAP and we've seen that already, you know, with, with Parler, it wasn't a DAP, it was a social media site. Amazon Web Services didn't like the um, sort of political leanings of the service and they banned it. Um, and hackers who get into the cloud account can um, steal tokens. Um, and potentially, of course, if Something goes wrong with that, you know, account. The cloud could even just delete the data. Now, now with respect to hackers getting into cloud accounts and steal, stealing the um, tokens, that that's already happened um, the, the, a few months ago. Badger Dow lost 130 million dollars because the hackers got into their Cloudflare account and started inserting malicious content into the, the web pages um, that users loaded loaded into their browsers when they're interacting with Badger Dow. And, and that malicious content inside the web page was interacting with the MetaMask wallet to steal people's tokens. So that's really, really something that you don't want to happen um, if, if, if you're building a Web3 service. Um, finally, of course, similar problems can also occur um, with the, the, the local nodes that are running on a service like Infura. The, the problem is that um, the DAP code is trusting the data and the interactions of the blockchain um, that, that it sees, uh, you know, with respect to, the, to, to these local nodes. And if they're malicious, of course, they could um, send, send back in, invalid data, do a sort of reverse SQL injection attack and, um, d d you know, cause the same kind of problem that we just looked at with BadgerDAO. Um, the other problem, of course, is uh, you know, if there's a problem with the uh, cloud and something like Infura goes down, well, that's going to widely in impact your ecosystem. You, you, you know, builders of services can avoid this kind of problem by running their own local nodes, but that's uh, not, not always the way people do things at the moment. So uh, just a week or so ago, 
um, there was an outage of Infura and that stopped MetaMask working and that pretty much hosed you know, uh, uh, people's access to the Ethereum ecosystem. So um, the, the final problem with this architecture is, you know, a DAO cannot um, update, adapt that's really running on the cloud. And that means the community's not in control, the, the developers are legally responsible for the service and, and control can't, can't be decentralized. And the reason is that um, a DAO is built from smart contracts and it runs on the blockchain and it can't reach out of the blockchain environment in, into the cloud environment and you know configure and control and update that code. Um, you know that requires uh, you know a legal counterparty um, who has given Amazon Web Services say their credit card. And the ch challenge with this, of course, um, is well there are lots of challenges. I mean, the people running running the service obviously could um, switch it off. Um, so, you know, the, the community is not really in control. I mean, the DAO can pass proposals and motions telling them what to do, but they're sort of relying on, on their goodwill. Um, but for the developers, it's a really big problem too, because the regulators will look at a service like this and say, well, um, you know, it's not decentralized. Hey, you developer, you know, your credit card's in that Amazon Web Services account. And you know, therefore, you know, you're responsible, not the DAO. And you know you're not decentralized. The tokens are securities, and um, maybe you're a money transmitter. So, in many cases, people wrestling with these problems have self-censored, and we saw that um, last year with with Uniswap when it took down about half of, of its tokens. Um, it effectively self-censored. So, fixing this um, was our mission, and and now you can build the new Web3 internet. And you can do this using a new form of super advanced smart contract um, called canister smart contracts, which are software actors. And these are really, really interesting things. Each, each canister smart contract is a bundle of um, WebAssembly bytecode and persistent memory pages that that bytecode alone can execute within. And this new kind of um, smart contract makes it possible to create dApps that can scale, it allows the blockchain to scale, um, because of course it allows these smart contracts to run in parallel. And you can create these canister smart contracts using any programming language that compiles down to, to WebAssembly. Um, two, two popular languages people use at the moment are Matoko and Rust. Matoko um, is something, I mean, when, you, when you're trying to choose a language, I mean, you, you know, obviously, you, you, I'm sure you'll have heard of, of Rust. Rust is a very, very mature systems language, and very, very powerful language. Um, Toka is a new language, but you know, <clears throat> I would recommend you, you 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 play around with it and consider using it. Um, Matoko was designed to take maximum advantage of WebAssembly, <clears throat> um, and it was actually designed by the one of the two creators of WebAssembly. So. Um, as you imagine, um, there's, it plays very, you know, WebAssembly and Matoko play very well together. And it provides a native software actor programming framework. It allows you to code sequentially in direct style, even though the internet computer environment is synchronous in contrast to a normal blockchain environment, which is synchronous. Um, it provides native support for this thing called orthogonal persistence. Um, where you can just you know define uh, you know variables, data types, collections, and so on um, in, in memory, and just leave them there as a way of persisting your data. Um, it has uh, number types with unlimited precision um, for DeFi and and other um, special ICP environment support. And one of the really great things about Matoko is that you know, if if you've already got Solidity or JavaScript or similar skills. You, you'll be able to learn Matoko super fast. So something else you should know about the internet computer is that it has this um, ground, groundbreaking reverse gas model. And, and that means small contracts now pay for their own computation. So in this model, you know, uh, developers get hold of ICP, for example, through a financial exchange. 
and they convert the ICP to something called cycles. Cycles um, are the computational fuel that power canister smart contracts. And canister smart contracts have to be charged up with cycles. It's a bit like a Tesla car, you know, you charge a Tesla car up with electricity, and when it drives around, uh, it consumes the electricity in the battery and eventually you have to fill it up again. Um, canister smart contracts work, work the same way. You charge them up with cycles and, um, you know, it, it, it burns its way through those cycles, um, you know, performing computations and storing data and, and things like that. Now, the great advantage of reverse gas is it means that users don't have to have tokens in order to interact with um, you know, services you created on, on, on the blockchain. Now, the internet computer um, follows what I call Satoshi philosophy, where you try and get rid of intermediaries. And um, reverse gas combines with something called internet identity in a very beautiful way that allows users to authenticate themselves in a way that preserves their anonymity um, by using uh, features that are built into to modern hardware. So modern hardware has secure places um, for cryptographic keys. And using a protocol called WebAuthn, um, signing can happen inside the hardware. And there's no way of ever getting the, 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 the keys out of that hardware. So they can't, they can't be stolen. So, you know, when you interact with a service running on the internet computer, um, essentially, you know, your session key will be signed inside that secure hardware. And you can tell your device to do that um, using the fingerprint sensor on your laptop, say, or face ID on your phone, or, or if you want to do it yourself, an HSM device like a Ledger wallet or a YubiKey. Um, and this, of course, gets rid of one of the main um, barriers to entry and obstacles and, and hurdles and the, the, the primary friction that users experience when they want to interact with, with a blockchain service. Um, they don't need tokens anymore. They don't need to manage the keys. They need to worry about somebody hacking onto their computer and s stealing the keys. Um, they can just create uh, an internet identity anchor and assign a bunch of devices to it. So for example, um, there's a chat service called OpenChat and I can access that using um, my identity anchor um, from my laptop, from my phone, and, and, and other devices. So I just mentioned OpenChat. Uh, this is a sort of pioneering social fi service that's been built on the internet computer. It's a chat service. All of the chat messages are processed by smart contracts on the internet computer and stored on the internet computer, including you know um, images and, and, and video albeit it deletes old media messages to keep the um, storage consumed by your, your account down. And this thing already has ten, tens of thousands of users. Now, this is something you should keep a close eye on because it's the first project um, planning to assign control of, um, to, to a service nervous system, which is a kind of advanced community down. This is tech that's just coming online right now in beta form on the internet computer. And they're working on this as we speak. And soon that DAO will be in control of open chat and it's gonna, it's gonna run a decentralization sale that puts the community 100% one, in, in charge, as well as um, raising funds that can be used um, for things like feature bounties and bug bounties to fuel even more R&D. And once this thing's totally decentralized, it's going to sort of lean into the social fi um, function fun, uh, aspects of its functionality. So social fi is social media combined with DeFi, and that means that chat accounts will start behaving like crypto wallets um, that hold ICP, Bitcoin, Ether, NFTs, and things like that. And you're going to be able to send tokens with chat messages and much, much more than that. Um, another really interesting aspect of, of, of this social fi service, which I think um, demonstrates how many, many new services should be thinking about growth, is that it's going to be continually airdropping DAO governance tokens randomly to users who are active, who are referring other users, who are participating in tasks like content moderation. Because in this new Web3 world, um, you know, users are going to be 
owners of these online services, but they're also going to be part of the team that runs them. And that's um, how they're going to overcome the sort of monopolistic Web2 um, services run by big tech. They're going to embrace millions of users and enlist them, turn them into the advocacy team um, with the objective of getting, you know, rapid viral growth that allows them to become, you know, giants and bring billions of people into the decentralized ecosystem. Something else that's just coming online now, um, which you uh, might consider playing around with uh, in, in the hackathon, is that um, the chain key cryptography that powers the internet computer is being surfaced through APIs that are going to allow you to control token balances and invoke code on other blockchains um, directly without any bridges or anything like that. This is completely game changing. And it's going to allow you to combine different blockchains together and to create a kind of meta glue um, that enables you to, for example, create a DEX on the internet computer. Um, which allows you to trade uh, ICP for Bitcoin, um, in which the Bitcoin is just sent to, you know, an address that belongs to the DEX on the Bitcoin blockchain. There's no wrapping or bridges involved whatsoever. So that's something you should look into, and that's available right now, or at least um, the, the first iteration, which, which applies to Bitcoin, is available right now. But I think there's other functionality coming on that will enable you to interact with, for example, Ethereum. So... Uh, as you can imagine, all of this has involved an awful lot of work, and uh, we've been working on this for a very long time, um, pretty relentlessly. Um, I think I started talking about Divinity in 2015. Uh, the Divinity Foundation was founded in 2016, and we just had this very brilliant team of engineers and researchers from uh, academia, crypto, and the world's leading te technology organizations. Currently, um, we have uh, more than 260 staff, the vast majority of whom are in R&D. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a really extraordinary team. It's probably one of the strongest teams of all, in, in all, of, all of tech. Um, you know, engineers, researchers, and cryptographers have, have been published, I think, in more than 1,500 publications, um, on the way to 100,000 citations. Um, 194 patents we, we, we counted, and that was just from the people we spoke to. And the team has what I call a blockchain maximalist ethos. Uh, that means we believe in these, you know, potential social impact that blockchain can have, and particularly, of course, what the internet computer can deliver. And we wish to save the world from compromise and enable everything to be built 100% on, on, on blockchain. And we want to make sure that the blockchain community gets the advanced technology required to complete its mission. Since since uh, Genesis, uh, May 21 last, last year, um, growth has been pretty good. Uh, about 55% of the total supply of ICP is now locked inside the network nervous system, this DAO that actually controls the whole network, another revolutionary aspect of the internet computer. Um, 3.5 billion um, TVL, locked. 44% uh, of that's staked in what we call eight-year neurons. Um, more than 70,000 ICP have been burned. Uh, this blockchain produces right, bl blocks at a pretty prodigious rate. Um, it's already produced 785 million blocks um, in, in less than a year, uh, but it's accelerating and, and, and you know, eventually it's going to have created uh, trillions of blocks. Um, in that time, there have been 3.4 million update transactions of more than 75 billion transactions when including both update and query transactions. There have been 1.9 million internet identity anchors created. Uh, there's more than one terabyte of data stored inside Canister smart contracts. And there are 519 node machines in the network currently. There are hundreds more in data centers waiting for, for configurations. Um, there are 56 uh, independent node providers. Those are people like that you know run these node machines, and currently 35 subnet blockchains. Um, don't confuse subnet blockchains with uh, what you see on some other blockchain. Uh, internet computer subnets are combined together to make a single unified blockchain environment using chain key cryptography. So, in in this past year. Um, 
Definity has accepted 240 grant applications, which is pretty impressive. Um, there are more than 1,600 public GitHub repos containing internet computer code, and there have been more than 80,000 code commits, um, which I'm sure you'll agree is an astounding achievement. A um, couple other projects um, to, to draw your attention to. One's called Discover. I think those guys are raising, either have raised or in the process of raising a lot of venture capital right now. Um, they've got more than 100,000 users um, and more than 700 portals uh, that have been created on that site. Uh, another one called Entrepot, um, uh, which has hosted I think, more than 200,000 NFT transactions. And what's really remarkable there is that despite hosting so many NFT transactions, um, it's only cost on report um, $620 in transaction fees, which I think um, speaks to the efficiency of the internet computer. So, you know, we want you to join thousands of um, other devs now building, um, you know, dApps and services on the internet computer. And join this internet computer movement to realize Web3. Here's, here's a, um, a little diagram showing how people are building um, equivalents to, you know, well-known uh, Web2 services, you know, that run in decentralized form and eventually be controlled by community DAOs and be fully tokenized. And, uh, you know, if, 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 if you're building one of these and you're not listed, I apologize. There are literally hundreds of, of services being built out built in, out right now. So um, big trends for 2022. Um, DeFi uh, is, is going to be huge um, by the end of the year. We're only just actually activating a lot of functionality that's really needed for DeFi. Once you see um, a lot of these services um, fully decentralizing by assigning the control to community DAOs, um, those community DAOs will, of course, create governance tokens which are then dispersed to users in a decentralization sale. And, you know, you're going to see an explosion of things like DEXs that enable people to exchange one governance token for another and so on and so forth. Um, we've been discussing really interesting social FI um, projects already. I know there are a bunch of people working on GameFi, which, of course, combines games and gaming with DeFi. Um, and there's lots of really interesting aspects to that. You know, you've got to work out how to stop users cheating. Um, you can use uh, what, we know, what we call the random tape, which is this perfect, unpredictable, unmanipulable, unstoppable randomness that the internet computer makes available, and, and, and many other things. There are even people working on multiplayer, um, real-time multiplayer environments um, using the internet computer uh, as, as a game server, effectively. And this is just, you know, taking it even a step further than open chat um, using blockchain to store and process chat messages. And then, of course, there's the metaverse. Um, if any of you are interested in what might happen there, go to ic.gallery. It's an early version. I don't know if they've shared the betas and so on, but um, they've created a metaverse environment using Unity, and I know those guys are working on multiplayer stuff too. So, um, final thing I'll say is, you know, um, there's a there's a a participation bonus, if you like, um, for in really, really developing your internet computer skills. And that is that internet computer skills are going to become a, su a superpower. Um, and the reason is, you know, so software is eating the world, but smart contracts will eat software. And to imagine why, just consider that when you build a system on the internet computer, you don't need to protect it with a firewall. It's automatically tamper-proof, just like smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. And then consider that the world spends $172 billion a year on cybersecurity, you know, firewalls and seam logs. At some point, the enterprise world is going to start seeing this as very, very attractive. Um, cloud services cost the world $500 billion a year. And overall, we spend five trillion dollars a year globally on IT. And I believe um, the internet computer is going to simplify IT and help us move past a lot of um, problems that have, you know, bedeviled um, the corporate world for a long time. So, um, you know, uh, this is a great opportunity to be involved with an 
an ecosystem that, um, you know, is just right at the beginning of the growth curve. Um, awareness isn't that high yet. You know, imagine what's going to happen when um, industry awareness grows from the half a percent or whatever it is today to sort of 90, 95 percent. We're going to see some um, really exciting things happen. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for taking part in this hackathon. And most importantly, good luck.